Hello, and welcome to the meeting of the Family Law Subcommittee of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. Um, call for public comment. I don't see any attendees. We can come back if anyone joins um, and, and uh, do that. So uh, let me uh, take roll. Bashan? Present. Hamilton? Present. McRae? Here. Sarush? Here. Um, and uh, Judge Wiley indicated that she's going to be a few minutes late. I see we have an attendee. I want to call for public comment. If you would like to make comment, please raise your hand using that Zoom function. Okay, looks like we don't have any um, public comment. So I'd like to get started. And I think there are basically two topics where we, that we need to finalize today. The one is conservatorship and guardianship. And then one is the broad topic of the violence prevention and the several types of restraining orders. And in addition to the ones that we have looked at already, um, Judge Wiley thought that we should consider gun violence restraining orders because even though they're mostly obtained by law enforcement, other parties can uh, request a gun. Oh, Judge Wiley. Hi, great. So I will add, uh, Judge Wiley, I added you to the role. Thank you very much. Um, My apologies. I'm going to briefly be here and then switch over just for a few minutes. Okay. So I was just telling the group that you had suggested that we consider gun violence restraining orders in, turn, in, in addition to the other violence pre prevention restraining orders that we've been looking at. And as you noted that in addition to law enforcement, other people can request these. And I, I was looking at the information form, the Judicial Council information form, and it says that um, an immediate family member, an employer, a coworker, um, an employee or teacher at a school also are can can pursue gun violence restraining orders. Right. So um, the fact of the matter is, uh, if I may, um, I, I think and the law allows for anyone oh, those categories of um, applicants to apply other than law enforcement because the restraining order doesn't provide temporary protection for the applicant is uh, I, I personally have not seen them done by any non-enforcement individual just because it puts them in danger even and there's usually there may not be necessarily dv or enough violence any violence for a another type of restraining order to be requested at the same time. Um, so I do agree that they should be included because the law provides um, that kind of restra restraining order to be applied for by these kinds of other kinds of applicants, but it's just, I just don't see it. <laughs> As I indicated earlier, I, it, it's extremely rare. Um, we've only seen two to three, I think, per year, the last two years that it's been effective uh, in San Francisco. I do think it, it very rarely does happen. Um, but in the event that someone does seek some help uh, with filing a petition, I think um, we should discuss whether or not that's something we would uh, want the paraprofessional to do. So, so just then turn to the broad topic of restraining orders. I'm sorry that I didn't send you my notes earlier. I was trying to gather all the information together at, at, to send it at all at once rather than sending e serial emails. So I don't know if you've had a chance to review the notes that I sent about my conversations with the different subject matter as experts on the question of these different types of restraining orders. But essentially there was just broad agreement that paraprofessionals should be able to provide assistance. And there were suggestions about specific training requirements that should be provided. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about any of these or if there's just, if you all agree that we should include all types of restraining orders. <clears throat> any, 
you know, does anyone have anything to say on this? this was I agreed from the beginning that I think we should include them. Uh, so I'm glad that, you know, uh, the, the result of um, your work and interviews with the different subject matter experts um, is the same. So I agree. And I think, uh, you know, one of the focuses, I'm sorry, go ahead, Stephen. I said, and I just tend to be ambivalent. I want to include it great. It's getting to areas that are outside my area of expertise. So it's more of if the, if the subgroup as a whole wants to include them, I'm not vocalizing any opposition to that. I'm just not trumpeting it either. I'm in support. They're very form intensive. Um, it's not, I, it's something that I think a paraprofessional could do. I think at some point, Elizabeth? oh, sorry. Oh, um, yeah, no, we, we, um, I think that this would be a great um, access to justice topic. And Sharon, did you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I just, um, was there a consensus across the group or was there any disagreement on any of the finer points? There is, there is broad consensus. The only thing that kept coming up is the importance of training so that people, the paraprofessionals un understand on how to guide their clients on which type of restraining order might be a best for them. And like Fariba was saying, if someone comes in and saying they wanna do a gun violence prevention order, the paraprofessional might wanna to talk to them about the advantages of getting uh, a, a restraining order that provides the added protection of stay away orders because they, except for the, there's one category that the elder financial abuse is the only one that doesn't include um, removal, a, a gun ban. I, I believe that's the case. Um, and so I think that was the only focus was just to ensure that, the, that we um, require very specific training. <laughs> Well, then I defer to the experts. Okay. I think Steve and I, I, I looked at the uh, specific issues and I thought that all of them um, were good in terms of, uh, you know, kind of the broad representation that you'd want the paraprofessional to do, uh, including, you know, court support. Uh, so I think uh, from my perspective, everything looks good with the inclusion of the GBROs. And I'm sorry, Fariba, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to make sure everyone- I am so a sorry for the interruption. Uh, uh, Steve and I, uh, first of all, um, my question was about their, their role inside the courtroom. So I was just looking at that section here. Support in court. So support in court, are we talking about 6303 support? Um, or whatever we come out come out of this group kind of support. I think and it I, would be the same as what the group as a, recommends as a whole. I, I okay. think the same would apply. Okay. Okay. And I think at Unless some point, anyone the, else has a different thought on it. At some point, Steve and I had talked about um, attorney supervision, or at least not to yeah review supervision for this particular kind of work. And I had made some calls to our local um, DV agencies uh, years ago when there was more funding, they um, at least three of our larger um, DV agencies had attorneys on staff um, that supervised their legal department. And then they had to let the attorneys go then contract it with attorneys. And now I checked um, recently and none of the agencies even um, regularly check in with attorneys uh, regarding their cases. They either refer it out because it's too complicated or they just do the work themselves. So just FYI. Can I ask for some clarification on the in-court um, support? So this, this would mean if it was parallel to what was decided for family law, then this would mean what? That the, that the uh, paraprofessional would be sitting next to the petitioner um, but could not respond to questions? 
I mean, I don't think we've finalized it, but I think that's kind of like where we were going. Okay. And, and you all agree that that's the appropriate model for this case type as well? I thought we had, we had discussed whether or not the court would directly ask questions of the support person if there were any issues uh, that the, the court thought the support person uh, would be able to answer or respond to. I thought we did create a little bit of a pathway for that, not necessarily advocacy, but uh, if there's something that can uh, help the proceedings in the court. We, we broached that issue and then I had a meeting with the Family Law Committee of the California Lawyers Association and the conclusion was that at least as to the family law issues and I would carry it over to these issues too, that that was the line that would not be crossed. In other words, the court could direct the questions to the party, but we the two concerns were the way you answer a question can offer, open up the opportunity for advocacy. And number two is there would be probably some courts that would go beyond just asking questions and it, it would create us, you know, the, I hate to use the well-worn phrase, but the slippery slope. All right, thank you, I'd forgotten. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I just wanna make sure I point out that the, the um, party would be entitled to a separate 6303 support person that the paraprofessional does not take the place of a 6303 support person. Do they get a support? Okay, so let's, can we take that a little bit further for me? I'm trying to think, I've never had a support person with one of my clients who's a protected party because that's what my role is generally speaking. Do they, is a support person permitted if the party's still represented by counsel? Yes, okay. their roles are- As long are as it's uniform, then I'm fine. I'm, judge, the judge is shaking her head so, yeah. Uh, it, Judge, have you had that experience where you, you had a, uh, and by the way, both sides can have support people. It's not just limited to the applicant. The, yeah, but, as long as it's uniform. Yeah. Ooh. Correct. That, that, I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but there, they do have the opportunity to have support people in the court proceedings oh. with them. Okay. So going back to the speaking issue, uh, the paraprofessional speaking in court, I, I still have the concern that you've got a judge with a heavy calendar who's just desperately trying to move the mail. You've got a paraprofessional who obviously knows the answer that the judge is looking for. And the party who is tongue tied or wh whatever, and the judge turns to the paraprofessional, are they really going to be expected to say either stay mute or say, I, I'm not allowed to respond to you. I, I would, and I think when we roll out the program, that's gonna be something that's gonna to have to be disclosed to the judges and say that they're not allowed to, you know, that that is part of the boundary of the program is that they're not allowed to directly question or involve the paraprofessional in the hearing or pro, in the hearing. But I do get yeah. the I, I, uh, heavy burden that is placed on the paraprofessional on the spot. It's very hard to say. And I, again, I've seen and I've heard that judges have reached out even in the audience to a family member who may be there, mm -hmm. who is trying to desperately say something. So again, I'm just saying we have to understand that it's really, we must put ourselves in the position of the person in the courtroom who is being put in that position by a person of authority and power in the courtroom. That's what I'm saying. What, what I would say is, you know, generally speaking, when we get that family members, the judges that I usually deal with, they're gonna tell that person they're not an attorney and they're not allowed to address the court unless they're a witness. And I think it's, it's appropriate to have this bright line. And then we may find out through the pilot program that this isn't the best way. And I think once the pilot program rolled out, attorneys in court that see this, maybe that resistance that I'm hearing from my constituency would, would, would lessen if they realize it's actually gonna move the hearings along. Or the hearing that they're waiting to finish will get moved along so they can start, get, gets moved along quicker too. So 
So I'm wondering anecdotally if there's a way that we can gather that kind of information or that type of feedback um, as we move along with the pilot, just so that um, if we do need to make uh, a shift, um, and I and I think I've communicated previously that I, I I would be one of those judges who would want to hear from the support person if there's something that for one reason or another, the, the self-represented litigant is just not able to articulate for me. Um, and so is there a way that we can kind of uh, gather that information throughout this process? Wouldn't we be surveying the judicial officers in the pilot program areas where there's wherever, whatever our geographic boundaries are, I'm assuming they're gonna get surveyed to get information. So I would hope so. Do we ever do that in other pilot programs? I'm sure. I would imagine it happened with Shriver. I don't know. Um, but, but that is something that's being discussed as part of the pilot rollout conversation. Yeah. And I would think with the, with the judicial officers that we now have as part of this working group, having a vested interest in seeing this program succeed, I think they could do a lot to encourage their brethren to report back how the what, what, how this is working and do they want, I mean, I think that they could help us get the information from maybe judicial officers that might not uh, initially respond to the surveys. I had a question. Um, would it change um, your position if maybe we carved out um, that the people who can answer questions, who can address the court are people who have received a JD um, that way. Yeah, <laughs> you see my head. No, I, it, there has to be a bright line. If you're not going to get the 100,000 plus California members of the California Lawyers Association to be adamantly opposed to this program, I think you're going to have to create the differentiation. If you, if you diminish what our law to, what, what us being attorneys means, because now the paraprofessional speaking at the hearing in any capacity, I think initially that's going to make it very difficult to get this um to to not have this opposed by by the cla they're going to oppose this and everything else that we put before them um, i don't not. think that that's the only reason no, that's that not that's not accurate that is absolutely we should stop from proposing something to increase access to justice i understand the concerns but i'm just again speaking for the people who are not at the table or in this group and just wanting you guys to consider um, that if you guys don't want prior LDAs, prior paralegals, maybe we can expand it for a different tier, those who have received a Juris Doctorate. Yeah, Just you're, you're, again, for consideration. That, that's not accurate though, Elizabeth, to say that no matter what the CLA is gonna oppose anything that's proposed, there, there's a reason I am on this working group. And the reason is, is to make sure that we've come up with a proposal that's extensive, that is modeled for success, but also when I go back and talk to the CLA and say that this area had my input, this area had my input, and I need CLA to back this because otherwise we've lost all credibility, I expect them not to come out with a blanket proposal. I think, I think that the attorneys out there, there's going to be the, the ones that are not educated about this and have not involved themselves and haven't taken the opportunity to listen to these public meetings, there's going to be a groundswell. You're going to get letters to the editor in the Daily Journal and everything else, and we can't stop that. But in terms of organizations that would take a position on this, I know that the California Lawyers Association is not going to take an absolute, absolutely not position on paraprofessionals. And this is the one area where I'm saying, where I know that if, if we cross this line, then, then I can't give you that assurance anymore. I also think that this is an opportunity, um, you know, during a pilot to not only survey the judicial officers, but to um, survey the consumers Correct. to see what they think, um, to think, of, um, to see if they thought that they were well served. Would they have been better served if um, the paraprofessional could have spoken on their behalf or did the paraprofessional properly prepare them because I think that in this model the paraprofessional can still confer with their client and coach them on what the judge is asking um, how they think they should respond they're just not speaking on their behalf is that right correct that, that's what what 
my suggestion is, is to deal with this issue. And then it, the, again, in the pilot program, by the attorneys being exposed to the paraprofessionals in the courtroom, they may realize that it's actually hindering uh, access to justice to not allow the paraprofessional to respond and they may change that position. Um, so yeah, that's that, where I think we'll grab, gather data in the during the pilot program. I want to remind everyone that the whole topic of in-court representation is going to be a separate standalone agenda item for the full working group on the 26th. And I think I raised this with the Family Law Subcommittee some weeks ago to ask if you wanted to postpone um, generating a recommendation on this issue because we will be taking it up on the 26th. And I, I say this only to make the point that there will be further opportunity to consider and vet this issue. And certainly in terms of what we write up for the Family Law Subcommittee recommendation that will be going forward, um, we can indicate that there were different views and perspectives on this topic within the Family Law Subcommittee committee that I think the general consensus and if we're wrong that it's the general consensus then we do need to uh, ferret that out today but the general consensus is the position that they would be present but not speak but there were other views uh, I think that would be fair to say understanding again that you'll have a, an opportunity to engage in a broader discussion about this on the 26th I think that's accurate for my own edification, I apologize. <laughs> I know, I know, Stephen, you've 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 made this point before, but can I just understand better what is CLA's position on I, what is the rationale for its position that a judge would not be permitted to ask questions of the paraprofessional who's helping a litigant in the in the open courtroom? And one of the reasons I'll tell you, one of the reasons I'm 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 asking the question is this sounds like a restriction on the judge and the judge's ability to conduct the proceedings before him or her. So I, I'm just, rather than the paraprofessional, right. I understand courtroom advocacy is a, is a se separate issue, but I'm concerned about this restriction we're placing on judges. Yeah. And, so the, and, yeah, the, and, so, and Greg, you just, you took the question right out of my mouth. So the, the issue is blurring this line between paraprofessional and counsel. The issue is when we allow support people in for the domestic abuse victim, they are not allowed to respond to questions from the court. The judge is specifically precluded from involving them in the proceeding. The issue is when we answer questions as lawyers, those, that is an absolute opportunity to engage in advocacy, that you don't give a neutral answer typically. You're gonna give the answer and phrase it in a way that is advocating for the outcome that you want for your client. Um, that if you give judges discretion to ask questions that are say specific, just in terms of a, a form or specific, even opening that door is in our opinion gonna be a concern for, it's gonna create an issue where a judge maybe doesn't follow the bright lines of what, what's permitted and not permitted. And again, creating, you know, if any may possibly consumer confusion, what's the difference between having a lawyer and a paraprofessional if the paraprofessional is able to speak for you in court? So th th that's, the, that's, the op that's the opposition. And, and I would say the, neither the California, the California Lawyers Association has not voted or taken a position on this, but I've had meetings with both the board of the California Lawyers Association and with the Family Law Executive Committee. And this was, this would be an issue where if this is included in the initial rollout and included as part of the pilot program, um, I would conclude and suggest that it's going to end up resulting in opposition to the entire program. So just so I understand, so in terms of effectuating that policy, say if the working group were to, to back it, you're saying that there needs to be an affirmative restriction within the set of rules that we use to stand up this program that courts are not permitted to ask questions of, of the paraprofessional who's sitting at council. Right. I, and I understand it seems silly. They're going to have to ask it to the party who's going to turn to their paraprofessional and get the answer. But, but that is exactly what, what I, with that restriction, I do not anticipate or expect CLA will, will, when they start having stakeholder meetings, oppose what we're proposing. I just want to also make sure I understand correctly, is the restriction going to be on the judges or the restriction going to be on the paraprofessional? 
both ways. But the paraprofessional is not permitted to directly address the court nor answer questions by the judge. I don't, can, I mean, I don't know, but can we restrict what judges can do? Yeah, because think about the with the with the um, support person in the domestic abuse case. That's the that's a statute, though. Well, we're going to have a statute. Oh, no, right? the statute. I don't think the statute says the judge can't ask questions. I think the statute just defines the role of a support person. Sixty three oh three. Yeah, I'd actually be curious to know what that actually says. I am a paper <laughs> and pencil. I think we're even turning pages. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Okay. But if you can try to probably can find it online easier. I know. <laughs> we were doing that. I'm just trying to distill a little further, Stephen. So uh, CLA's opposition is that they're concerned that by allowing paraprofessionals to answer questions, I can see what you're, what you're saying is it opens a door for advocacy. But that it, and it really at, at bottom, their concern is that it diminishes the role of an attorney in the, in the right. legal system. And, and let me be clear, the CLA, the board has not voted on this issue yet. I've had meetings. That is a, I would, what I'm expressing is the position I expect them to take if the paraprofessional is allowed to participate and actually respond to questions or, or uh, advocate uh, during uh, legal proceedings. Um, Linda, could you actually pull it up because I'm pulling it and, and sh share it with us because I'm looking at 6303 and there's another piece that I think is interesting because it says where the party is not represented by an attorney, the support person may sit with the party at the table, which I think is a little bit different than we were talking about earlier. Yeah, you know, I that's what I, okay, yeah. That actually answered my earlier question. I thought you could the support person couldn't come up if they have an attorney. That they're not supposed to, Fariba. Oh no, they can come up. They can sit well, with them at the table. They you're just they have to be quiet. They can't talk. You, yeah, no, it's just it, they can accompany the party to the proceeding. But if you look at the actual look at B, where the party is not represented by attorney, the support person may sit at the party with the party at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that means they don't get to sit up there if they have counsel. A restraint on the judge asking the support person a question. The support person may yeah, I don't think it says judge. that, Leah. But it doesn't, it always says it's a person may sit with the party at the table that is generally reserved for the party. So can, and I, the can I just jump in for a second here? I, I mean, I think function is what matters here. It says it's the function of a support person to provide moral and emotional support. It's not the function of a paraprofessional to provide moral and emotional support. They are playing a, you know, uh, a professional role as a legal professional akin to like the nurse practitioner to a doctor. And so when we think about whether someone is allowed to speak in court or be asked questions, I think we have to first start with why are they there? The support person is there to provide emotional and emotional support to the person. Um, is there anything in here about the, where's the part in here about them not being able to talk or the judge not being able to ask questions? I don't think it. I don't think it says. I don't think it says it in there. It just says that they're not supposed to give legal advice. In subsection A, I think is what it said. Right. The person is not a legal advisor. The paraprofessional is. I mean, so it's yeah. I mean, yeah, I do think I don't want to derail the conversation in the sense that, as Leah indicated, um, we're going to you know we're queued up to have this whole conversation as part of the full working group. I think, um, Stephen, it's very important to understand, you know, the conversations that you've had, and I think you've been really clear and helpful in, in kind of getting that perspective across. So I don't know, Leah, I'm or- I'm not you know. sure where we are with this. I, um, I'm trying to backtrack how we got here. It was the question about what the paraprofessional will be authorized to do in these violence prevention matters. And we got going on into in-court support. Yeah. Um, I think if we stick with 
the idea that this subcommittee had a general consensus around the position that the paraprofessional could sit at the council table but not um, speak and indicate that there were differing views then perhaps we could move on from this right now, because again, we'll be talking about it on the 26th at the full meeting. I think that's accurately it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the, the next topic to turn to is the conservatorships and guardianships. And as I explained in my email, I was able to reach several subject matter experts from diverse, uh, with diverse backgrounds or um, diverse uh, working situations. And yesterday I sent you the recommendations from two of them. And then I just got the recommendations from a third one and I wasn't able to put it sort of in the same format, which I had done with the others. And, and so, and, and the, um, so I'm not sure how we want to proceed if we want to look at those separately. Mm. Um, oh, and what I thought we could do is go through, what I had intended to do was starting with the, the first two that I had sent yesterday, the ones from um, Jonathan Kahn and Tamara Rice to look at, you know, for, for the most part, there was an agreement um, that, that almost all of these uh, tasks should be included. There were a few exclusions. There were some that I put in there when they had to do with the estate. So those we know were, were taken out. Um, and also these, uh, these were uh, like very detailed uh, lists of tasks and detailed recommendations about the educational requirements. So I, I, I thought where we could start was to go through each of the tasks. It does, does get repetitive, so I don't think we need to go into to all of them because um, it's a lot of the same tasks for different types of, you know, the different phases of the case. Um, but anyway, I, I thought that this would be a good way to start is to, I was going to share this. Um, And I'm, I noted just on, on this one, I sort of merged the two from um, Jonathan and Tamara and indicated where there wasn't, a, where they didn't agree in their recommendations. I indicated that there was a split recommendation, but now I think we would, if we want to, we can also consider what we got um, from Ileana from public council as well. And unfortunately I wasn't able to find someone who could participate in, um, elaborate more on their recommendations. I did send you what, um, what Jonathan Kahn sent in terms of the reasons for the uh, tasks that he was recommending excluding. So. Um, Linda, uh, can I ask you if there was a meeting of all of these people? Yes, or did they there was. These things in separately. So they well, had a so there was a, there was not a meet so it, it, actually there were several meetings there were all to, all together there were three meetings but there were two when they were all there but those meetings all we got to we didn't have time to get to the review of what was should be included or excluded so what the what we used the time in the meetings for was to build out what the tasks were and to get general agreement about the tasks. And then when I, then I sent this out to them and asked them to put in their recommendations. Um, it, it, it actually just took a long time. It was many hours of, of these meetings. Um, and so we didn't get to, I had hoped we could get to a discussion about inclusion and exclusion during the meetings, but that was provided separately. And I just think we should um, use this is a quick opportunity to thank those of you on this working group who identified this team for us to work with, which includes um, you, Dana, and Fariba, and um, Sharon, and just acknowledge that these folks spent hours meeting on yes. this topic and working on it. So, and I have on a separate screen, Ileana's recommendations, um, you know, an approach might be where 
everybody says include, we include and we focus on the air, on the split areas simply because I do think it's fair to say I only participated in one meeting, but I think that there were generally different um, default positions in terms of whether or not paraprofessionals should be authorized to work in this space. So I, I think where everybody's saying include, that probably suggests that it makes sense to include. That makes sense to me, Leah, but also if you can explain those default positions, that will give us greater context. Well, I, I just think some seem generally more open to the idea. It's not a, um, a, a default position, like a substantive legal default position, but rather generally feeling like this is a difficult and complex area of law where there's high risk and therefore paraprofessionals generally shouldn't be authorized um, to act versus a default position of this is rather form intensive. It's not actually that complex. And so I just think people seem to come to the table with different perspectives. Um, Linda, please tell me if I'm wrong. I, so I, I think it means something, I, I guess what I'm saying, where they all agree, it is a consensus of different, uh, different views coming together. Does that seem like a good approach then to just go through and and um, and see where there's differences and focus on those? Does that work for everyone? Works for me. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, and it's it's we're going to have to do a little bit of interpreting on Ileana's. So it looks like the first couple of tasks, there was general agreement. The first one, um, I'm not sure where, where it says N-A as opposed to no or yes. I'm not sure and I didn't get a chance to ask her what was intended by that. So- it Looks like no sure. to be, no to be. It says N-A to be. But maybe she meant no, I don't know. Well, no, because there's places where she says no and there are places like here, she says no. Oh. There are definitely distinctions between where she says N-A versus no. So, and I don't, so I'm not sure how to approach that. That's on this topic, the first one. Was she not that so able to be here with us today? No, I wasn't able to get anyone who could be here with us today. Why don't we not deal with the NAs and go to the no's? Because there, there is a clear difference. Okay. G through R in Ilyana's right. no. Right. So it's the objection. So I guess I would want to know why. So the one on the uh, left is um, Jonathan. Johanna and who else? No, this is just Johanna did not provide a response. Okay. This is Jonathan and and, and Tamara. Okay. And Ta so Jonathan is with the Santa Clara Court. Tamara yeah. is with the uh, Santa Cruz County Council. Okay. And then the one on the right. That's from Ileana. Okay. So I guess I would want to. I hate to say it, but uh, I would want to know why she's saying no. Right. Are we saying because two of them said yes, one of them said no, we go with the yes? No. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I, I think we're going to have that. That's going to be the result with all of these that were, they said yes and she said no. So I'm not sure if we can. Maybe we'll have to that. try to have another meeting where she can come. Okay. Were there any no's or exclusions on the list on the left? I get her, I can't remember. There, there was, there were, there were the exclusions for um, the guard, the, where it was an estate and that we've already agreed is going to be excluded. There were some where Tamara said they should be included. These ones that are highlighted and say split, these are were all instances in where Tamara said to um, uh, exclude them uh, and to include them and Jonathan said to ex, uh, exclude them for the reasons that he explained in the um, 
in, okay. in the email that I sent. Gotcha. <sighs> So maybe I so, should reach out to uh, um, Ileana and see if there's some time that she might be available. Maybe all three of them though. Or yeah. right. it, it might be it might be hard to find a time when the whole group and all of them can be available yeah. in time to um, yeah. to notice this, unless we don't in, include th this in our recommendations that that are going forward. Um, for the February meeting, and we set, and we in the recommendation that this group I, puts forward for the February meeting. I thought we had till April on this particular aspect. Anyway, I think we're ahead. Okay. Oh, I, I didn't realize that. I thought we were trying to include this. Oh, that's right. Conservatorships and guardianships are okay. So why don't we do that? Why don't we come back to conservatorships and guardianships? I'll find a time when people are available to join us and then um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send one of these. Um, well, I, I don't know that we have any meetings yet set for family, do we? After the February meeting? I think I think we have the three of them met in one session to discuss the differences they have in, in, in position with regards to those items? I can try to do that. that I think that would be important too. because I would like to encourage a robust conversation. Sometimes you have a position, but then when you hear from other experts, you change your mm -hmm. mind. So okay. having all three of them in one conversation would be important because none of us are experts on this and I don't want to second guess. I want to make a very informed decision on all of these. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so why don't I, I, I try to set, so you want me to try to have a meeting with all of them separate from a meeting with, with you? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, can't, other than that, I can't take a position based on just reviewing their written document. I want to hear the discussion. Okay, so um, so other than that, I think we're ready with the recommendations. Um, the, oh, there was one other thing I just wanted to bring to your attention. I was going to bring up, um, hold on a second, because I think we finalized all the other recommendations, um, including on the domestic violence. The one thing was uh, having to do with adoptions. I know there was a general agreement that the uncontested step-parent adoptions would be included. And, um, and uh, Stephen, you suggested that I contact Robert Walmsley yeah. with the um, Academy of California uh, adoption attorneys and and I finally was able to uh, connect with him and he in general was okay with uh, it, it didn't have any concerns about having this the uncontested step parent adoptions included but he did say that it was really important that the paraprofessionals have specific training on how to provide notice and he said that he was con his only concern was that if notice was not done correctly, it could really uh, create problems. On the step parent adoption. On the step parent on adoption. The step -parent adoption okay. right? it, could, it could end up being contested or it could negatively affect the prospects for adoption. Right. So we wanna be sure to include that in the recommendations that this training, the specific training be provided. That sounds reasonable. But other than that, I, I think we have, we've gone through all of the topics and recommendations, and it's just we're ready to draft the recommend the your memo. So I will work on that. Is there anything else? I don't think we have anything else outstanding in advance of the February meeting. And will there be a separate report on the DV then uh, on the uh, violence prevention work? Well, I thought it sh it could. I think it'll be the same memo, but there'll be a separate se section. Section. There's okay. a discussion topic. Okay. Yeah. Thank Does you. that make sense? I don't. I don't think it needs to be an entirely separate memo. Okay. Great. Well, I think we can end early. 
<laughs> thank you all for, for the tremendous amount of time and work you've put into this. Same thing to and you, really, Linda. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Well, everyone.